forget Shark Week. Here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's Bomber Month. Every Monday from December 2nd to the 23rd, we'll feature a different American bomber. From the venerable World War II-era Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress to the cutting-edge Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. Never mind the announcements. Listener questions can wait. Let's get straight to the bombers with your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot Vincent Aiello. Today, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in Whiteman Air Force Base, Central Missouri, and we're joined by two gentlemen. They're going to help us talk all about the B-2 Spirit. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are you doing? Good. Vincent? Good. Excellent. I'm doing well. Thanks. It was a nice drive out here. Actually, we're very pretty country. All right. So we're going to introduce first Senior Master Sergeant Steve Napier. You're joining us to talk a little bit about the behind-the-scenes maintenance side of the B-2 today. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm glad to be here. Okay. And joining us also is Major Nick Anderson, call sign Wolf. How are you doing, bud? Doing awesome, Vincent. Great. All right. Senior Master Sergeant, we're going to call you Steve to make this a little easier. Awesome. All right. Uh, give us a little background, if you would. Where are you from? What have you done in the Air Force and so far? And what are you doing now? Yeah, so I grew up uh, outside of Houston, Texas. Uh, came into the Air Force right out of high school. Okay. First duty assignment was to Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. Uh, I was a jet engine mechanic on KC-135s. So we spent a lot of time outside in the cold and uh, going back and forth to uh, deployed locations. Mm -hmm. After that, I uh, had an opportunity to go teach uh, jet engine mechanics in MacDill Air Force Base, Florida. So I spent about four years there. and A little warmer. It was a little warmer, nice tropical <laughs> weather, plenty right. of time on the beach. But after that, I uh, got my assignment here to Whiteman Air Force Base where... I worked with uh, Maintenance Squadron for the last uh, four years, mainly in the production atmosphere of that. Okay. And how many years of service are you up to? Uh, just hit 18 years of service 18. in September. Wow. All right. And Wolf, now for you, uh, where are you from? I guess you probably have some college in here as well. And what have you done in the Air Force? So I grew up in uh, Oregon. I started off with some interesting jobs before joining the Air Force. Oh, yeah? I uh, worked at an office supply store. <laughs> I was a bus boy, and I worked on a llama farm. <laughs> So those were the, the... This sounds like good preparation yes, for the Air Force. Those were the three qualifications that got me in the door to be a pilot. Then I went off to pilot training in Oklahoma. After college, obviously, I went to Oregon State, so stayed local. Okay. And then Oklahoma for pilot training, flew T-6s and T-1s there, and then got selected to fly C-17s, so heavy airlift, and flew that for about four years, was an instructor in the C-17, and then flew out to Whiteman for a... Got selected for 1 of 20 for an interview, and had to fly the B-2 simulator with no training and prove that I could land it. I did not land it on the first time. <laughs> wow. Did a go around. So I thought I was uh, not going to get hired, but then they called me back. It's actually on New Year's Eve and said I was hired. So then huh. moved out here and I've been flying the B-2 for about four years now. Been at Whiteman for almost five. Oh, wow. I didn't realize, of course, I don't know that much about the B-2 in general. So it's almost like an application or interview process? So the process has changed over the years. When I got hired, it was an interview. So they would fly about 20 out and do a social interview. Uh, you'd sit down with the ops group commander and he'd ask you some questions, just kind of fill you out. They'd look at your resume, your credentials, and mm. just see if you're a good fit. The weird thing about the B-2, obviously, is the long duration flying. So right. if you're going to spend 24, 40 hours in a cockpit with one other individual, you want to make sure they can carry a conversation. <laughs> be normal. And be normal. Yeah. And so that's why uh, the interview is important. That process has changed a little bit now. We've been getting younger, uh, new hires directly from pilot training, but we still do a, a fairly good job of uh, reaching out to commanders and, and talking about the individuals. And, and we've had some awesome hires in the last couple of years. Got it. All right. Now, and I have to say, being a Navy guy, when I think of the Air Force, I think of all the best equipment. And certainly today we'll talk about that. But I also think about the best locations. Generally, you guys have some really nice locations. And I'm not slandering Whiteman, but we're kind of out here a little bit. Uh, do you get any kind of special pay for being out here? No special pay for location. <laughs> well, we're what, about an hour and a half from Kansas City? A little small town, but probably very close-knit community, I would think. It was a little culture shock. We were living in New Jersey, my wife and I, and we had one son at the time. Now we mm. have two. You know, I told her, hey, we're moving to Knob Noster. And she was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and reality did not sit in until as we drove up to our neighborhood, there was an actual milk truck, which I didn't think existed, like an open air <laughs> rattling milk truck that we followed on uh, one of the highways into Missouri for about 30 minutes. And that's when it hit her. But we've loved it. It's been yeah. awesome out here. 
You know, when I look back at my career, I was in Meridian, Mississippi for a spell. I mean, Lamore is still fairly austere and Fallon. There's some places where because you're away from some of the creature comforts you all get used to, particularly in New Jersey, I don't know how close you were to Manhattan, but you bond together closer and, and you, you get together for barbecues and family events and things. So I, I'm sure you'll both look back at this time fondly. But this is the B2 hub, correct? I mean, you'll deploy... And I think I remember seeing some in Guam, but this is pretty much the headquarters. Is that true? This is this is the only base on the planet that has B2s at it. And we have uh, 20 B2s total in the inventory, mm. and all of them are here at Whiteman. And we do forward deploy to Fairford, Guam, a couple other uh, locations, but uh, we always come back to Whiteman. Yeah. So this is the hub. And you'll fly operational missions from here. We will. And we are really the only platform that does uh, strike missions from the CONUS United States. That's crazy. Everyone else will forward deploy or be somewhere different than their home station. Mm -hmm. They won't take off with the loadout and the crew that's going to fly, fly the combat sortie. We do that here at Whiteman. And when you do that, you're also, oh, by the way, transiting over. I mean, maybe you choose a route that's not, but you're going over continental U.S. and population centers, and we're getting ahead, but is that part of the plan is to avoid overflying, or is it safe enough you can fly straight over New York City? Well, obviously, in the States, it's extremely safe, and uh, we have a great relationship with the air traffic controllers. Mm -hmm. um, they get used to us flying a lot of locals around Kansas City. Okay. If we do go to combat, it's easy, obviously, in the States to coast out, and then a lot of water on either side of the U.S., so that mm -hmm. part's also easy. It's getting feet dry and going into the fight where we train for, and that's the big focus. All right, well, let's jump right in then to the B2 spirit. Let's start with what it was designed to do. And I think anyone who knows a little bit about this airplane probably already has a decent idea, but where did this generate from in the beginning? Uh, what was the requirement, and, and what was it designed to do? So, obviously, B2 is a long-range stealth bomber. Mm -hmm. uh, only one right now, so kind of the requirements on that were we don't want to be seen and we want to go in, drop our payload, and get out. Yeah, so strategic, both conventional and nuclear, I believe. Correct. Yeah. All right, and to your point, that is why it's shaped the way it is, and that's why it's painted the way it is. I think at the time, if I read correctly, there was some question about the B-1, and so they said, well, let's start the requirements for this new bomber, but then the B-1 came back, but it's really a different mission anyway, isn't it? It is, and if you look back, historically kind of at warfare with bombers as radars got better during the cold war the mentality was go in fast and go in low and that was what the b1 was designed to do right. that's why swing it's wings. supersonic mm -hmm. swing wings train following radar and then as stealth came online with the f117 obviously limited payload on the first platform so the next question was as radars are getting better can we build a bigger platform that can carry more bombs and deliver them with precision and be extremely long range. So that's the four kind of pillars of the B2 mm -hmm. is stealth, range, payload, and precision. Okay. And those are kind of the big four that the B2 was built around, and uh, they executed very well on it. And the stealth part of that means that you can go into very hotly contested areas, let's say, or a dense integrated air defense, and you have certain things that we'll talk somewhat about. I know a lot of this is protected, but you have different methods and built-in features to make yourself, as you said, Steve, invisible, essentially. Maybe not perfectly invisible, but minimize your signature. Is that a better way to put it? That's a good way to put it. I mean, I would say that uh, we really strive for stealth. We strive to be invisible, but we settle for being low observable. In the platform, it's kind of a misnomer to call any aircraft stealth. Mm -hmm because it's virtually impossible to make something invisible right. on radar in every band. And frankly, if you actually achieve that, then that in itself is obvious, because then there's just this void where there's usually returns everywhere else. Exactly. So, <laughs> so they can always find that. Okay. But the idea is that, uh, we'll get to it, but you probably don't have a particularly great speed or you know ability to defend. Uh, like we had the SR-71 pilot on uh, Brian Shaw, and I asked him about, hey, what if a missile comes up? Can you pull seven Gs to defeat it and all that? And he said, no. You have speed, and that's it. And so in your case, I'm guessing you have, I don't know if stealth is the proper just global word for it, but, I mean, your idea is if you're not seen, that is your best capability or tactic or defense or anything, right? That's a great way to put it. I, okay. I'd say that's exactly it, is, All right. is we use stealth as our primary tactic. Okay. Now, Steve, with that comes a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that you guys do as far as if a panel needs to come off an airplane, 
to repair whatever. It's not just like in the Navy, we can pull a panel off between launches on the carrier, fix whatever needs fixed, slap it back on, and boom, off he goes. But we're not managing radar cross sections and absorbent materials and a lot of other things. And wave me off here if, uh, if you need to. But when it comes time to do something from your side of the house, it's pretty involved. Is that true? Absolutely. Uh, actually, our top mainest driver is the actual LO system. And, uh, Low observable? Yeah. And that's, okay. that's probably the best way to kind of think of that feature is, is just like an engine. Mm-hmm. So you have an engine system, but uh, the coatings is also a system and it has to be managed that way. Okay. They spend some time getting nice and pretty. I'm sure. Well, and it's not just, of course, the beauty. Uh, you know, I know you didn't mean that, but the point being is it looks good when it's done because that's when it's going to be the most effective. Absolutely. The threat. And by looks, of course, not just the visual, but the electromagnetic, let's say. And probably some IR as well, I'm guessing. Now, you guys, I mean, again, getting ahead, do you do, is a day mission part of your repertoire? I mean, I would think you'd kind of stand out visually, but maybe that's not an issue, or is, is most of your stuff at night? You know, we can operate anytime, anyplace. So if we need to do a day mission, uh, we can make that happen. Believe it or not, even a black aircraft is extremely difficult to pick out. Mm. Uh, when you get the atmospheric effects of even a blue sky background and you put a couple miles or 10, 20 miles in between you and the aircraft, it starts taking on that color. Mm. And so flying formation with a, other B2s and trying to stay in, in position, you'll find that when you waterline it and you look down the pencil edge of that aircraft, it virtually disappears. All right. So it is difficult to fly in formation with, and we absolutely could employ it in the day. Okay. So global strike anywhere, anytime, conventional or nuclear. Usually on this show, we have aircraft that do a lot of different things. And so my next question is, you know, what is it good at? And sometimes it's not necessarily what it was designed for, but you guys have, I would say, a fairly not straightforward maybe, but every mission is different, but is there much variety to what you do? And if so, is there one mission that really works well for you? I mean, you're not going to go out and carpet bomb, for example, right? Or could you? I mean, I I know that's kind of a weird term, but B-52s, we're still doing that as recent, I think, as, I don't know, do they do that in Afghanistan? Anyway, I know they did in Desert Storm, but is it maybe a couple bombs well-placed or a bunch of bombs? I mean, is there one mission that the B-2 really is best suited for? I think it may be help. I'll run through a couple of vignettes of some of the missions that we do in mission sets. Perfect. Starting on, since you brought up carpet bombing and just general purpose unguided bombs, uh, we actually had our weapons school here drop 8,500 pound bombs, Mark 82s, and they had a three ship. So they dropped 240, 500 pound bombs over the, uh, I believe it was the Nellis test and training range. It might've been Utah, but uh, they did within a couple seconds, released all those weapons and they did a giant essentially X. And so we do train to that because as the war drags on, you know, you might have to use general purpose bombs. Mm -hmm. And from a young air crew perspective, uh, it's like getting a guy to shoot a firearm using iron sights first. Right. And then having him upgrade to the Gucci stuff with the red dot and laser range finders and all that. So it's still a skill set that we have to maintain. So that would kind of be the first kind of training mission set that we uh, do. And is it called, sorry to interrupt, is it, is carpet bombing a PC term? Are we, is that what it's called or is there just general purpose? General purpose okay. bombing because the general purpose just means it's got steel fins on it and it's ballistic only. So um, we'd probably call it just uh, unguided bombing is, right. is the appropriate term. Kind of the second vignette would be our most important mission is the nuclear mission. For that, the nuclear bombs that we carry are actually general purpose in the sense that they do not have guidance on them. So that skill set that we train to with those, you know, 500 pound or 2000 pound general purpose bombs that don't guide themselves to the target. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other skills the crews need to use, but those apply directly to that nuclear mission when you have a, you know, weapon that the entire world is watching when you employ and historians for centuries will look back on how it was employed. Yeah. And so that's the second mission set. And there's a lot of nuclear surety that goes into that. So we have to train, you know. How do you mate the weapon to the aircraft? What is the steps it takes to do that safely? And uh, that's a big mission set that we have. I have to think the protocols on that are, are enormous. And getting ahead down to the notoriety, we'll talk about a, a swipe at that that uh, Hollywood took uh, in a movie some years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I think to your point, in both cases, the eight 
what you say, 80, 500 pound bombs or a nuclear bomb, you get to a point in space where everything is planned so that when physics takes over, it gets to the appropriate spot. So you're at a certain altitude, airspeed, heading, angle of attack, even possibly or whatever, then I'm guessing you're probably holding a cassette button and the computer decides when the weapon comes off or weapons and then uh, gravity takes over. So same thing for the nuclear. That's interesting. Okay. And then, so you said there was the general purpose, the nuclear, and I interrupted you. So they're probably the, you know, third one we could talk about is our uh, precision guided munitions. Okay. You think of that as the night one war. So that's uh, targets that uh, our senior leaders have deemed we have to hold at risk. Mm -hmm. So we plan and train to be able to execute those missions. So that could be any type of weapon that we carry that's on the conventional side. So we can carry 16 2,000 pounders with a mixture of 5,000 pound weapons in there as well, the GBU-28. And then we can carry obviously 80 of those 500 pounders, but we can put JDAM tail kits on them. And now we can do GPS guided munitions and precision strike with 80, which is uh, a lot more than you'd see on a fighter. You know, yeah. a fighter's carrying four to 12 maybe, and uh, one B2 carries 80. And then uh, the third kind of conventional loadout you'll see is we have the GBU-57, which was created specifically for the B2. We're the only platform that carries it. It's a 30,000 pound weapon and we can carry two, one in each wow. bay. And the weapon is incredible. Yeah, It's unreal. The accuracy, the blast effects of that weapon is, once we got that on our platform, we found that we could hold targets at risk that we thought we had to use nuclear weapons. Once we started using this and testing it, we realized that we don't have to employ nukes to take out certain mission spaces that normally we would. All right. So with your precision capability, I'm trying to think of a scenario that might make sense for the listener. So in the general purpose, you might fly over, let's say, an enemy airfield and string an X of bombs and maybe crater the runway or take out the hangars for their aircraft. But with the JDAM, you can fly to a single point release enable. And then when these weapons come out, one could go take out the fuel farm. One could go take out the fighter hangar. One could take out the alert revetment. One could take out the approach end of each run. I mean, these things are like, I don't want to call them, you know, robots, but they're out going to specific spots. And it's possible for you to get in a single basket where all of these could come out and each go to where they're supposed to go and inflict damage on in a very precise location. Is that a fair summary? That's Exactly true. And we have an entire shop in our, we call it the OSS, the Operational Support Squadron Basement, which is where I work now. And we have targeteers, weaponeerists, and uh, intel experts. And then we also have uh, higher level Air Force and DOD organizations mm -hmm. that help us weaponeer these things. That's a hard problem to yeah. set to go with. It's somewhat easy to allocate 12 bombs and go, where? what are my 12 highest priorities? But when you start bringing a four or eight ship and you're in the 400 plus number of, we call them DIMPIs, desired mean point of impact right. selection process where how do I pick 400 points over the, the space that I want to drop on mm -hmm. and really go back to effects-based targeting. Right. So what effect do I want to have on the enemy? What do I want to degrade? What's more important? Is it the runway? Is it their fuel? Is it their infrastructure? Is it uh, fighters on the open ramp? Is it capabilities? Is right. it SAM sites? So that, that's a big problem set and we talk about that all the time. And some of that will be dictated to you. Right. So the air tasking order may tell you exactly attack this airfield, which gives you some levity, not levity. That's like humor, right? Some long, what is the word? Anyway, gives you the option to choose the uh, flexibility. Flexibility is probably a good one. Thank you. And then other times I'll say, Hey, we need this, this, and this, uh, attack. Steve, the, uh, ordinance part of this is that, are you involved with that at all? Or is that like a whole separate squadron or, who? uh, so it is a separate squadron. Okay. They have, uh, weapons load teams. Uh, whenever the frag comes out, they'll, We'll deliver the weapons out to the aircraft and the weapons loaders will okay. install them. Is there a particular part of the airfield where stuff will get loaded depending on what it is? Depending what you're doing, you do have to have some spacing requirements, mm -hmm. especially with live munitions, obviously. Yeah. But okay. generally they can be installed inside a dock. All right. And uh, Wolf, was there one more? So uh, we were talking about the different mission sets. Did I interrupt you? You know, so we had unguided nuclear and then precision strike okay. with JDAM. Another mission set that we have is we can actually employ the uh, stealth cruise missile, the AGM, okay. air-to-ground munition, 157. The AGM 157 is our stealth cruise missile. They cost a couple million bucks each, and we can carry 16 of those. Wow. So we do have to train a little bit for that standoff fight mm -hmm. where we don't want to put American bodies over the enemy territory. We want to maybe degrade uh, their capabilities first, and mm -hmm. then we'll push in. So we do have to practice that mission set, and that's really our big four. Okay. 
So similar to the archers sending in volleys exactly uh, before the foot soldiers run in with their swords kind and, of and it's amazing how little warfare has changed that it, it is very <laughs> similar yeah. to lining up archers and firing those in yeah. there just a little bit more accurate and okay. a little bit more yeah. devastating true how about the variants um a lot more of these were i think originally intended to be built and i don't know if that meant there would have been follow-on variants but we ended up like you said with 22 and we had 21 and then we lost one in uh, 2008 Guam. in Guam. Mm-hmm. I had just left Guam about two weeks prior to that. That was the year I graduated college, actually. Was it? The year uh, I joined the Air Force. Yeah. We lost one. I went back in 2010, and they still had the little tubes in the grass trying to vent all the fuel out, I guess, because it took off uh, with full load, or at least a lot of fuel. But All right, and so we didn't build as many, and so are they all B2As? They are. We're okay. still on A model. All right, but we have different blocks, right? So there's incremental improvements as we go, or has it been changed much? It has, and you know, if when you add make new weapons to the aircraft, there's obviously a lot of software changes. How's that displayed to the crew? How do those mechanical systems made up to the weapons bay? Mm-hmm. And so there has been a significant amount of upgrades over time. And then, you know, we have an entire test squadron here at Whiteman, believe it or not. Everybody thinks that all test is at Edwards, and there is. Um, but then we actually have the operational test here at Whiteman that'll go fly those sorties and, and practice them. Gotcha. And I thought I remember hearing once that you'll take a laptop with you and like plug it into the airplane and then you have the ability to communicate with the folks back home because let's face it if you take off out of Whiteman and you're going somewhere half a world away you spend a lot of time in the air well the world situation can change a lot in 24 hours or even less but your targets could change anything else I mean again you stop me if I'm treading on thin ice here but uh, you're obviously communicating back home and and you can even upload missions as you go is that true that is true we have a the ability to accept airborne mission transfers. So you're exactly right. That air tasking order cycle, you might take out outside of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe you take off and you're flying halfway around the world, you know, 20 plus hours, and you took off before knowing what your target set is. And so you have to have an ability to, while the fighters are planning right there close in theater, Mm -hmm. and they find the target sets before they take off and then they push in. You've been airborne for maybe 12 hours at this point. So you have to have an ability to receive that. So we actually do have uh, computers on the jet and we can receive those. It's essentially an email system and then we can download those, dump them into the jet and off we go. All right, obviously a protected email system. Steve, on these longer flights, I mean, hydraulics need to be serviced, oil needs to be serviced. I'm guessing the aircraft is obviously built for these longer flights, but is there anything particular you guys will do for the longer flights beforehand? And then what are you looking for when it gets back? No, so the biggest servicing aspect of that is fuel. So right and the there. the people inside it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Fueling them. Obviously with the other arm of getting the aircraft 30 hours away, 40 hours away is you're going to need some tankers to get there. But yeah. th- everything was designed for extended operations. Will you do that with just a crew of two then, Wolf, or you have a relief guy? or and We don't, and that's what's very unique about the B-2 is first when they designed it, we did have a third seat, third ejection seat in the back behind the two pilots, and that was for a, a navigator, and they re- actually replaced that navigator seat with a physical computer rack, and that computer rack does a lot of the work that you know a, a navigator would have done You know, in theory, that sounds like it reduces workload on the crew, but you take one person out and now the workload actually goes up for the crew. So we're very busy that entire time uh, flying, working, you know, what happens when the tanker slips, your targets change, Mm. all the computer edits that you have to do to make that happen. But even so, I mean, it's hard for anyone to be alert for 24 hours. I mean, I have to think if you're particularly taking off out of here, let's say going east, you know, there's a long, like you said earlier, a lot of water on both sides. I mean, is, can one of you unstrap and go relax, rest? I mean, is there facilities on this thing? I mean, it's got ejection seats, so there's obviously a very technical, tactical part of it, but are there some crew comfort areas as well? Or Yeah, just kind of paint a picture of the cockpit. It's probably no bigger than your average family sedan. Uh, you're sitting next in the front two seats, mm-hmm. uh, the two pilots. Uh, you each have your own controls, obviously, so the other person could step out. And then just imagine the sedan with the back seat removed completely. Okay. And in the back right, there's a essentially a, a John, a toilet that's just got some blue juice in it, and you can use that toilet. And then on the back left, you can imagine you don't have a ton of space, right. but that's kind of your sleeping space. And that's where the hatch actually goes down to exit the aircraft. And then you close that hatch, kind of like a submarine, mm-hmm. and you can actually lay out either a cot or a, you know, just a sleeping bag or maybe a blow-up mattress, and you can 
you know, sleep back there for a couple hours. Okay. So that that's basically your creature comfort wow. is for you, 44 hours plus. Do you bring a cooler and put some stuff in it, a microwave, a coffee? I mean, come on. We this do. is Air Force. I got to <laughs> keep up a little of the yeah, uh, exactly. inner service rivalry. But Exactly. It's definitely not five star, okay. you know, but it is, uh, it's, we do bring a cooler and then we have a convection oven that's built into the aircraft. So it's yeah. honestly not bad. And it's got the best view in the oh, world, yeah. right? You look out the windows and the sun's rising or yeah. the sun's setting and, uh, it, it, the amenities don't matter. You know, yeah. you treat it more like camping. <laughs> <laughs> glamping maybe. I yeah. It's yeah. Glamping. All right. So the B2A, some block upgrades and pretty much that's it. I mean, we'll talk later or maybe now's a good time as any, but eventually this will be replaced by the B21 Raider. I think they're calling it. So this will just stick around until that shows up. Is that the plan? The B-21 is a, is a great conversation to have. So we learned a lot with the B-2. And, mm -hmm. and you imagine that we built this thing 30 years ago. Yeah, crazy. Uh, really 30 plus years ago now. And it has stayed re so relevant in the fight. I mean, every combatant commander wants the B-2 in theater for that deliberate strike, that night one scenario mm -hmm. where the president says go, they want the B-2 in theater. And if it wasn't, you know, still capable, then they wouldn't be asking for it all right. the time. So you can only imagine the technological advances that we've had in 30 years. In the meantime, all the enemy radars have been improving, right? All the SAM systems that you're seeing from threat countries are, are really incredible pieces of technology. Um, they're all mobile and highly capable. And so it's very important that when you talk about stealth, the sh shape and materials is, is really your two variables. Mostly shape, a little bit of materials. So you can put the LO coating on, if you treat it like cars, you could put it on a F-150 pickup and it maybe marginally improves it. But if you start with a sleek aerodynamic Formula One car and then coat that with LO, you're going to be wildly better mm -hmm. than uh, the F-150. And so uh, we can't just coat our old aircraft in uh, special advanced alien technology and make them near invisible. It just, it isn't a thing. Right. Um, when you start looking at the physics of it. So using that 30 years to learn about what works and then build a new aircraft and also learn that a small fleet has a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. For instance, any part on the B-2, when you're only building 20 and you farm that out across the United States, uh, you could take the windshield, for example. You, you find a small shop that creates these special low observable windshields and after the 20 are built, they build a couple extra in the inventory and then they go out of business or they go in, they produce something else. And now as those windshields start cracking, now we need new ones. No one wants to build two windshields over the course of five years. So it's very, very costly to maintain a small fleet because of that. And the windshields isn't really, that's just an anecdotal story. It's really every part on the B2. And so building a lot of B21s and having them at different bases and keeping those lines running and keeping those uh, those jobs across America pumping out those parts because we have a larger fleet. It's so much cheaper for the taxpayers, it's so much more effective. And uh, that's why it's really important to have a, a new bomber uh, going forward in the, the late 2020s. Plus, I think I read that they took a page out of the F-35 on what not to do, and they're going to try not to, I don't think, uh, invite everybody to be involved with the actual production of it because that gets difficult. I think they shut the doors and they said, well, we'll come out with a plan when we're done, but leave us alone until then. I hope that works. And uh, so that'll be interesting to see how the B-21 Raider does. Okay. Well, we started touching on it. Let's talk about why it looks the way it does. And this particular aircraft has a very distinct shape. I don't think there's any disputing that. But a flying wing is not necessarily a brand new feature. I mean, we had those, I think, as far back as World War II. And so it's not necessarily an airplane that wouldn't fly if it wasn't for all the advanced computers. I remember flying little flying wings as remote control airplanes when we were kids. But it is nice in so much as it doesn't have a lot of the vertical surfaces of a conventional airplane, which could reflect energy. And it's probably fairly efficient. But uh, what else has gone into the shape, particularly like the trailing edge, which looks kind of interesting? I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about, right? Shape, shape, and materials. Right. So when you look at the B-2 and, and this, that iconic shape, that, mm -hmm. that flying wing, you can tell that every single panel on that plane is designed with radar it's in mind. It's thought out. Yeah. It's thought out. And that, that's what 
you know, makes it expensive. That what ma- that's what makes it unique, and that's what makes it so capable. Right. I still am just blown away seeing that thing <laughs> on the ramp or flying in formation or seeing it at air shows with my friends flying mm-hmm. in. I still stop and, and look up yeah. at that shape because it, it it's intimidating. Like- I mean, it's just it's spooky. It's all these things. And uh, Steve, when when you're dealing with the parts of it that were again purpose built for being not observable. Does that affect what you guys have to do? I mean, we already talked a little bit about, like you said, the beauty uh, of, of doing things. But, for example, if you need to work on landing gear or, God forbid, jack the thing up or replace an engine, I mean, is it harder compared to what it was like on a KC-135? Oh, absolutely. Uh, just kind of by design, everything is built into the wing. So you have to take that into consideration, you know. And engine R-square is going to take you probably 24 or 48 hours longer than it would really? as a KC-135. But by design, like we were saying, it's all about the shape. Yeah. And so that's just a limitation that we know in advance. So, of course, they've got the manuals and the training and the standards, and so there's a way to do it. But it does, I would think, um, create quite a bit more, I don't know, maintenance man hours per flight hour. I mean, is that something you guys advertise? If, if, if Wolf goes and flies for an hour, is there an average for what it takes for you guys to do the things you do? It does. Uh, I think recently saw it is uh, 114 Maintenance man hours per flying hour. So it's significant. I, believe it or not, that's actually gone down. Well, that's good. Okay. How about a cost per flight hour? Is that advertised for this airplane at all? You know, anything with the government in general, it's difficult to, to right. single Depends it out. what you, you know, include. Right, because you could include mm-hmm. the, you know, the airman's, the, every right? airman's salary. Yeah. You could include all the contractors. You, you could really include uh, public affairs, legal, everyone. Sure. Um, so you'll see anywhere from... Uh, in the twenties of thousands of dollars per flight hour up to $180,000 yeah. per flight hour, depending how you scale right. it. And the 20 is probably the oil and the fuel and the, fuel yeah, and the exactly. tires and the 120 is probably uh, all the supporting. Okay. And again, that's accounting magic. So um, as far as, I mean, flight control surfaces itself, to me, I don't know how you fly this thing. Is it using, well, just tell me, I mean, is it a form of ailerons or flapperons or just thrust even? I mean, what goes into controlling this aircraft? So, Steve, you asked, you said uh, you don't know how I f- fly this thing, right? <laughs> Do you? I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I say that a little facetiously, okay. but really you look at it uh, and when it flies, you're like, how is this thing actually staying in the air and not just cartwheeling? It makes virtually no sense. Yeah. But then when you go through the initial qualification in the B-2 and you get the classes on it and you see that it's actually a lot like every other aircraft. Mm -hmm. So one thing to look at is when you remove the vertical tail, the first thing you lose is the rudder. So if you need to yaw the aircraft and point the nose slightly left or slightly right Mm -hmm. to uh, do a crosswind landing, uh, you use your rudder to do that in every aircraft. Well, with the B-2, you obviously don't have a tail. So what they did to give you the essentially artificial rudder is it deploys spoilers on the side. So just like a speed brake on an airliner, if I want to yaw to the right, it'll deploy a you know speed brake on that side and mm-hmm. it'll make me cause drag and then my nose will track right. to the, the right. So that's one of the more interesting um, flight control surfaces is that from the inside of the cockpit, I'll tell you that it was almost it's almost exactly like a C-17 in the sense of uh, stick throttles, you bank left, it goes left, you push right on the right rudder and the yaw's right. Um, you pitch up, you pitch down, and there's really nothing that different from mm-hmm. other aircraft. And I think that goes to how beautifully it was designed, that you can take pilots who flew normal aircraft right. and you put them in the tailless aircraft, and you really don't notice a difference. Mm-hmm. That said, is it relatively easy to fly? I mean, you alluded to landings, uh, particularly in your um, interview or whatever, but is there any part of the flying that's particularly challenging? I'm thinking refueling, landings. We can start with landing and then refueling is very interesting too because of the design. So uh, with landing, uh, being a flying wing, you know, you hit ground effect where the aircraft cushions based on the downforce about one half a wingspan, right? That's like mm-hmm. Cessna flying, fighters, anything. That's about your aerodynamics, yeah. about your ground effect that you hit. And in the B2, because it's that giant flying wing that you actually go completely idle at a couple hundred feet when you're oh, beam over the... Uh, under run. Okay. So not over the threshold. You're just completely idle and it really lands itself. You just pick your aim point. If you did nothing, you'd have a little bit of a hard landing. It wouldn't be where maintenance has to put it on jack stands or anything. It would just be a firm landing. Right. But if you did nothing, pointed straight at the ground, when it hits that ground effect, the nose will pitch up just slightly and it'll actually balloon and kind of catch itself. And you need barely just a little hair of backstick pressure 
and it touches down beautifully and it's got great brakes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you fully deploy both wings speed brakes and those right. are massive barn doors. Uh, so it's got great uh, landing capability. What speed are you crossing the threshold at? Typical speeds are for the lightweights in the 140, and then you can be up into the you know 160 if, okay. if you're heavier weight. So it's a normal. Yeah, normal it really is not that speed. much different yeah. than even an F18. Now, if you go out with the I forgot the terminology, but you know you got those 30,000 pound bombs. If, if you go out to do something but you don't do it, can you bring everything back? Yes. Okay. So uh, just a longer roll out and higher speed, et cetera. And there's some reduced weights for landing, mm -hmm. about 50,000 pounds that uh, I need to burn off with fuel. Right. But I absolutely could bring 60,000 pounds of weapons back and okay. land. They cost a couple million bucks each, so we wouldn't really want to jettison <laughs> those into the ocean. No. no but, uh, <laughs> you know, again, you need to be able to. So I assume there's some mission planning for diverts if you don't. I mean, certain runway lengths and et cetera. Exactly. And security once you get on the ground. Does it have any kind of drogue shoots or anything when you land no buff drogue shoots okay. they built good brakes into it so yeah all right now we already touched on armament that's the next point i'm guessing no kind of um, crazy obviously air to air stuff or do you do any kind of chaff or flares or again is that just like needless because if they see you you're kind of in trouble at that point anyway yeah kind of the whole mentality of the b2 and this goes back to kind of the stealth and invisible mm -hmm. conversation that if i'm doing anything that highlights myself then that's bad. Mm. Everyone else out there is trying to, you know, distract and be the the rodeo clown, if you will, <laughs> out in the out in the fight. That they're looking at them instead of the B two. Mm. So we're not talking on the radio. We're not emitting virtually anything mm. unless we absolutely have to. And it's we practice completely silent calm out strikes. Where I think the best analogy would be we train more for like. Uh, what you'd see the SEALs doing in, in the Bin Laden raid, where mm -hmm. you know the shape of the house, you know the time and tempo that you kick down the door, you know that another guy is going to be clearing right while another guy is clearing left for you. And that's kind of how we look at night one is we're breaching into that country and we don't need to talk on the radios and really no one does because everyone has a plan and a task mm -hmm. and they go execute that task. Is there also another side of the coin where you will do integration. I was just yesterday in Las Vegas on the way out here interviewing the F-22 Raptor, and he was talking about, I don't know if it was red flag, I don't know the terminology real well, but at least maybe the weapon schools, I know they'll start together and then split off and then come back for big graduation exercises. Is there a capability or part of what you guys do that is involved maybe with F-22s or other parts of an, a larger overall operation or strike package? Absolutely. And that breaching analogy really is F-22s and F-35s. They're the ones kicking down the door. They're shooting the guys to eliminate the threat. Okay. And then we're bringing in the heavy weapons. And in that case, are you still able to do that calm out if everything is going well? Or is there maybe calmless communications going on? Or I mean, again, if we need to sidestep it, we can. But So our primary game plan, we attempt to build around the idea of virtually no communication. Then we have contracts and contingencies. Mm. So for instance, if I'm maybe off timing or I'm at a different altitude or I'm not where they plan me to be, uh, then maybe I'll speak up and take that emission hit and that, uh, that increased risk. But also you have to weigh what's a worse risk, right. right? If I'm in a different location, you know, I'm a stealth aircraft and I'm not emitting anything. There's a chance that we could have blue on blue where mm. they think I'm an enemy aircraft and I'm shot down now. So we do have those contracts and then we have contingencies. What if something goes wrong right. in the fight and then I'll speak up. And so we spend a lot of time at red flags, right. and weapon school integration sorties, planning those. And so if you come back from a mission where that happened, I'm guessing that's one of the first things we're going to cover is were we not where we needed to be and why? So we can learn and fix that. But then, okay, and then that resulted in this communication or whatever. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. How about performance? I mean, altitudes, speeds, I'm guessing G isn't really an issue in this airplane. What have you seen when you're flying? How many hours do you have in it? Uh, I have about 500. Okay. So, I mean, as high as you're willing to admit and speed wise, what, what have you seen? Well, I have not oversped the jet, which is, I need to knock <laughs> on some wood here. Oh, is that an issue? Uh, it is because uh, the jet actually isn't, um, it flies high subsonic. Uh, with that big flying wing, you're mm. never going to get, you know, Mach 2. It's not going to be an SR-71. SR right. You know, it's like building paper airplanes. The yeah. long wing one, you're never going to be able to throw as hard as the dart. Right. Um, Performance-wise for altitude, we fly at airliner altitudes, high okay. 30s, um, maybe into the 40s. And, uh, yeah, normal airspeeds. I mean, there's nothing that's outside uh, that makes the, the flying 
unmanageable. Mm -hmm. It's very a normal aircraft to fly. It's it's really the crew workload inside the cockpit yeah. that sometimes feels like a uh, stock trading floor of controlled chaos in the sense of everyone's typing as fast as they can. Or the two individuals are, are <laughs> typing. You're talking on the radios, you know, before the fight. You're, yeah. you're sending emails for updates on target sets and threats. You're changing your game plan. You're relaying that to the fighters. And that's kind of the controlled chaos. And then right when you hit feet dry, it should just be silence. Yeah. Because you, you got it all figured out before you got there. And you know, what? on that note, I've always wondered is, you know, in my 767, if I'm flying to Paris, you know, I coast out with New York. You talk to Chadwick, I think it is. I forget the exact name on the way over. And then you talk to, of course, everybody there. You guys take off out of here. You're talking to departure and then New York Center and then off you go. At some point, right, you have to say to everybody, hey, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I've always wondered how that happens. And then is there something you do to make your airplane? I mean, obviously, air traffic control needs to see you. Is there something you're doing to make them see you that you stop doing? Or is there something vice versa to that, that when it's time to get tactical that you guys do? So we always emit our IFF, the Identification Friend or Foe mm -hmm. uh, Squawk. And that's how ATC can really see us. So they're not um, getting a raw return. They're just getting your IFF hit. Yeah. And so we, we'll leave that IFF on and then when we need to turn it off, we'll uh, we'll turn that off and then go dark. Okay. And there's just a point in your flight plan where whoever you're speaking to, when they say switch to these guys, you just say, no, I'm not doing that. Or they just know, hey, your flight plan ends here and see you later. Have a good day. Yeah. At that okay. point, especially when you're in international waters, you just go do regard. Mm -hmm. So you can just be, hey, we'll be do regard. And you press at that point. Okay. Now we don't have to necessarily talk about different systems on the aircraft because that can get obviously technical, but do regard, I mean, are you able to see other aircraft out there or what systems do you have available to you other than the old eyeballs? Cause that's not always good enough. We do have uh, an air to air radar so we can sweep okay. for traffic to make sure that uh, that's not a factor. We'll also look in mission planning, look at the airways mm -hmm. and where those are and in deconflict. And then also we have live updates via, you know, some of the email systems on the jet. So right. we can have people on the ground looking at that to deconflict us to make sure that it's okay. safe. Can you still send your position back to someone other than air traffic so they can kind of monitor your progress or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. And then you paint a picture of you're kind of up there typing, doing different things. I mean, the, the takeoff and landings and refueling, oh yeah, we were going to come back to that, are stick and throttle. But otherwise, you're probably more of a system processor, aren't you? You're not really so much flying the aircraft as managing the systems. It's a task-saturating aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, we really have a, a kind of phase-rolling approach for some of the younger pilots because if you dump every task that is you know, probably going to happen on a younger pilot, they, they're going <laughs> to stall the jet and fall out of the sky. Yeah. So when you start getting up to the more advanced flying sorties, it is intense and there's a lot of work to be done. You never get it all. Okay. Every time you come back to the debrief yeah. and you're like, dude, I really misprioritized task A from task C. I got channelized on this one. I spent too much time. I should have just dropped that task, moved on to the next one. So there's constant discussions and debriefs on how to prioritize. Sure. Well, and that's the nature of our business is we come back and we don't necessarily congratulate each other on a smooth landing. We go right to the things we screwed up and let's do it better next time. All right. Uh, just real quick on the refueling. I mean, obviously the rendezvous itself is probably a challenge, but as far as in my Navy F-18, the Air Force will drag out a big basket and I've got to work to plug into the thing. In your case, I think if I understand correctly, you've got some lights under the aircraft, you fly to a particular point and then the boom operator can essentially fly the boom and refuel you. Is it difficult to stay in position or is it relatively easy? Obviously there's turbulence and weather and different things, but what's that like? For the rejoin portion, uh, that's obviously difficult for all pilots, especially if any Air Force, Navy, or even Army helicopter pilot will have issues with doing a comm out rejoin with another aircraft. So that's a normal thing in military aviation. Uh, you just need a time, a space, and an altitude. And you know where to be and you meet up with that other player. Um, you execute the contract. When it comes to refueling and what makes the B-2 unique is the embedded engines are actually uh, above the vertical kind of center of gravity point. Mm -hmm. So most aircraft that you see flying around, you know, a B-52 or an airliner, the engines are mated and they're underneath the wing right. and they're low. So what that means is when you pull back on the throttle and you go to idle, the nose pitches down. Right. And when you push the throttle, the nose goes up, which is where you usually want to go when you put the throttle in those positions. The B2 actually uh, is the opposite of that because mm. of the engine placement. So when I pull back on the throttles, the nose actually pitches up. And when I push forward on the throttles, it, the nose actually pitches down slightly. 
because of that engine location. So you don't really notice it flying around kind of the flagpole, but when you go up behind a tanker and you're doing minute corrections yeah. with the power, you're really having to counteract that with a stick, and that's what most of the young pilots okay. struggle with. Yeah, I would think, particularly since if they're coming out of flight training where they're just learning anyway, now they've started to build muscle memory, it's different. Is the I have to assume it's pretty advanced fly-by-wire flight controls. Is it not going to compensate that for you? A little bit sneaks through past the goalie and... Like you said, that's obviously happening. Exactly. So, yeah, a little bit okay. sneaks through. I mean, they, they are great flight controls, but uh, yeah, there's still a lot of manual flying that has to take place to successfully okay. get a contact. And you alluded earlier, so I'm going to ask you again, I, as far as Gs go, I mean, can you pull very many Gs or is it? Depending on the weight, yeah. uh, you can pull two plus Gs. So it's it's nothing to That's like what you need about. for 45 degrees angle of bank exactly. kind of thing. Exactly. Anyway, can so. do, yeah, 45 degrees. All right. All right, so we're up to the strengths and weaknesses, and this is always a funny one because it's a B2, right? So, of course, it's not pulling seven Gs, but it doesn't need to. But, Steve, I'll start with you. From your point of view, uh, what would you say, from a maintenance point of view, are some strengths of the B2? Uh, some of the strengths we have is just a support. We always have engineering on tap. Mm -hmm. that If we get tied up into something tricky, we can always reach out and ask. Another piece of it is just a great team of people everyone everyone loves this air, airplane yeah. especially the maintainers like a dedicated crew chief program you get your name on it and it's yours cool so th these guys love these airplanes and all right how about some weaknesses i mean again we, we've already kind of alluded to some but weaknesses uh it takes a lot of equipment to get this thing running typically it's three or four pieces of age equipment that all has to be out there. That's aviation ground equipment. Uh, aerospace ground equipment. Okay, aerospace. So okay. like your uh, your generator cart, for example. Carts and huffers and various and, uh, things. Kind of with the advanced avionics we were talking about mm -hmm. here, uh, it takes some cooling to do that. So you have a giant air conditioner that you're going to bring out and power up the airplane. And we'll just say this is just for like a pilot squawk. You're going to come back out and look at it. So it, d it does take a lot of equipment, keeping that equipment in shape. Mm -hmm. Is it... Unique equipment? In other words, if they divert somewhere that isn't used to having B-2s, do you guys have to send a rescue team to help them out, or can the standard Air Force carts and various things uh, get them turned and fueled and things? There's a few pieces of equipment that are unique to it, uh, but for the most part, it's fairly common equipment. Okay. And then obviously, if you detach to Guam or Diego Garcia or something, you'll send everything you need and everyone Absolutely. you need. Uh, how about from your point of view, Wolf? Um, again, what are some things you like about it? And with the weaknesses, again, it, it's tough, but I guess the way I've tried to rebrand this is, you know, whether it was money or policy or whatever, if you were king for a day, what would you fix that kind of just hurts your head about it? It's easy to complain about a couple small things. I'd say like a gripe in the pilot community mm -hmm. would be the uh, the lack of auto throttles. Mm -hmm. So when you're flying for 44 hours, you're, you're having to look at your airspeed indicator that wow. entire time to make sure you're not overspeeding or, or stalling the jet. Hmm. So it just kind of is this constant drain, or maybe it keeps you awake. I was about so, to retort that. <laughs> so maybe that's why we don't have them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's probably one of the few gripes. Everything else is pretty awesome on the plane. I mean, the maintenance piece, especially even now that I've been here like five years, over the last couple of years, I mean, you guys are blowing out records on maintenance and... We have one of the most reliable aircraft like in the inventory yeah. right now. It's They're just crushing it. That's cool. Particularly for such a unique aircraft. It's not like an F-16 and 15 and B-1, I think, all share engines and stuff, right? Or at least some. So uh, you guys are you're one off and not very many of them, to your earlier point, but doing it well. That's cool. All right, so now's the fun part, notoriety. We've already alluded to it. I mean, it's a unique airplane. There's no mistake in the shape. But where, for the folks who maybe aren't followers of military aviation, but they go see the occasional movie, or in the, I mean, you guys aren't in the news a whole lot, and that's probably by design, but where would the normal everyday citizen have seen or heard of the B-2 spirit? I'd say the most famous movie is Independence Day, you know, with Will Smith, and they have a scene where the I think the B two is shooting some stealth missiles at the alien structure. Well, you talked about that earlier. Yeah. Was that not one of the? It, and that's one things? of the mission sets. All right. you know? <laughs> so that was realistic. <laughs> yes, it was realistic. <laughs> uh, so there's one scene in there, and then there's a movie uh, with John Travolta called Broken Arrow, mm -hmm. where they lose a nuclear weapon, um, which is obviously a huge deal. I would it, think. Um, we would never do. That's a decent movie. And it's been in some of the, the Marvel uh, Universe movies, I think, a couple okay. of those, maybe some Transformers. Yeah, I think it was in a Transformer. Yeah. And also, it's pay attention to a Kansas City Chiefs football game. Oh, it makes an appearance there, doesn't it? Yeah. 4-0, by the way, as we're recording this. 
So one of the main things that you'll actually see it in real life, not in Hollywood, is going to be all the the flyers that we do. So we do like to show the public what they paid for and, and go take in and do flyovers. I've done the uh, NASCAR flyover in Kansas City. Um, we do the Rose Bowl every year. So I'd say your average American that would recognize the B2 is probably from the Rose Bowl because we do the parade and then the, the kickoff. Okay. Do you guys do that from here? Or? We do it from here. <laughs> it sounds a little silly, like, wow, no, you're it's... flying this really expensive plane all the way to the Rose Bowl just to show the taxpayers. But that's actually not the case. A lot of times we actually um, will go do a training sortie before yeah. and after. Mm-hmm. Um, we may even bring some weapons to the range and drop them and then go, you know, dump in there. Or uh, we, we get value-added training. Sure. And it's also, yeah, you know, one of the most important things for a B-2 pilot is to be on time. Right. Yeah. Right? There's even just the flyover itself can be a challenge to get the altitude, airspeed, exactly. all that. You know, the text chain goes out. And if, if someone is one second <laughs> after the national anthem, then oh, everybody is just it. like, Hey man, yeah. you, were, you were late. You were early. And... You don't hear about it. If exactly. you do it right, but you'll hear about it if you screw it up. That's true. All right. Uh, one more movie I can think of is uh some of all fears where there's a mix up between who's bomb and who. And I think they launch a bunch of uh, B twos. I, I can't remember if they launch out of here or wherever, but, uh, as part of the movie there is the climax. I think the Russian president is concerned. Once the B-2s launch, that's it. So you guys were the, the pivotal players in that one. So it's getting it done, and uh, that's pretty cool. I didn't think about the flyovers. That's, I'll have to add that in the future for the uh, notoriety. All right. Well, gosh, is there a particular... Actually, Steve, I'll start with you. Is there... Usually I ask for a good sea story. Uh, I don't know if that's a Navy term per se, but in considering the maintenance of the airplane or the things that you do, is there a particular day or event that you think back fondly on? Either something happened and you had to hurry up and quickly do something, or there was some ingenuity that needed to be involved. I mean, any good stories from your point of view with a B-2? Uh, so really the only thing that come to mind is... Uh... We had Operation Odyssey Lightning a couple of years ago. And Is we, it a real world? Or a... It was a real world mi- oh, wow. uh, mission okay. in Libya. And uh, kind of together as as a team, we got everything going together and got the air- airplanes ready. And that's just an exciting thing in Maine is to see all that going because there's mm-hmm. so much commotion and um, last minute changes to plans. Yeah. And it's just cool when you see those aircraft take off and well, they and come everyone... back empty. Yeah, right. So everyone's at their best. Speaking of that, do you guys maintain an alert posture at all? Not necessarily an alert posture. But if you were called up to go do something, you'll scramble the folks like you did on that one. We were ready. Okay, awesome. How about you, Wolf, uh, in your several hundred hours in this thing? Uh, any one particular mission stand out of you? I don't know if I'm allowed to ask. I will, and you can defer. Uh, have you done real missions? So... <laughs> Our primary mission really is the deterrence piece. And this is the thing a lot of the people in the public don't understand that Mm -hmm. when the B-2 is not being used, we are successful. So our, our, one of our primary real missions Mm -hmm. is the fact that we are training to drop nuclear weapons and our adversaries are watching when we're moving them on the ramp and everything that we're doing. Um, so really every sortie is we treat as a real mission and we, and we take that to heart. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that a little facetiously. If you ask if I have been to a combat zone and employed on um, a target set, I, I have not done that. I've only done it in training. Any particular mission though that just kind of stands out in your mind? Yeah, I would say um, it's always about like recency, you know, because uh-huh. there's so many cool memories that yeah. I'll just think back to like one of the last, actually the last sortie I flew, which was, was pretty recently. It was a training sortie. It was with, uh, you know, other low observable assets that we were flying with, some uh, F-22s. And we went out to uh, the Nellis test and training range. We flew an awesome sortie, got some great lessons learned. And you get so close with everyone in this community mm-hmm. that I happened to be flying with the guy I went to, through weapons school with, which is a six-month course. We, of course, got on the same sortie together. We're flying back, and the sortie was at night. And the sun, we're flying back east to Whiteman, and the sun's rising you know, we're yeah. seeing the sunrise. Mm-hmm. We're number three in the formation. And so there's three B2s and uh, there were some like kind of low clouds. So we were right in the contrails and just seeing two stealth bombers kind of just corkscrewing and kind of weaving through the sky and chasing each other's contrails as we were flying back home. I mean, some of those like moments, you look at it and like in the cockpit, you're like, this is unreal. That's right. Like if I had a GoPro right now, this would be something that, that would be all over the news, but I can't have a GoPro in the cockpit. I'm surprised by that. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, you're right. And those are the moments you need to cherish because before you know it, man, I'm here to tell you, you'll be on the other side, growing your hair long and getting fat. Uh, at least I am. You miss those moments. Exactly. You, know, you, you forget all the painful parts of the mission planning and the long debriefs, but the sun 
changes, if you will, as far as rising and sets. Those are same for me. Those always stood out. Speaking of that, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about it. Is, is there a part of your mission or your planning or your capabilities that like contrails are bad, right? I mean, not over Kansas on your way home, but in operationally, is that something you guys worry about? Yeah, and, and contrails obviously are a factor, but there's ways to mitigate. We have a we have great weather shop here at Whiteman mm-hmm. for operational uh, support squadron, and uh, we look at that and we plan to it. So we know where the contrail levels are, and and we plan to mitigate that. Yeah. So it is a factor that we factor into mission planning, but it's not the uh, end all be all. You don't have a rear facing laser that superheats the water on your way by and ev- evaporates the. Uh... That would be Sorry. nice if DARPA can make that. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that on board. <laughs> So I play off my own stupidity as, you know, the people want to hear it, the listeners, they want to know this. <laughs> anyway, all right, fair enough. Well, gosh, this has been a lot of fun, you guys, and uh, definitely well worth the trip coming out here. I've never been out here anyway, so this is this has been great. At this point, we usually ask what the future holds. Steve, we'll start with you. 18 years, I'm guessing you're not uh, walking away tomorrow, so you're going to keep playing the game a little longer? Yeah, keep playing the game until they make me leave, so yeah. that's the plan right now. <laughs> All right. You're going to stick around. Did you say, I think you said it, but uh, how many, you've been here, what, four years, I think you said? Right, uh, right at four. Okay, so are you due for a rotation soon? or We're always on the hook. Yeah. No telling, All but... Right. Is working on this, by the way, like a feather in your cap as far as if you've done this, that's like somehow uh, good on your resume or? I would like to think it is. Yeah. Uh, it's not your standard mm-hmm. aircraft. Uh, there's a lot of care and feeding that comes yeah. along with it, as we've discussed. But... Right. Would the Air Force take you and send you to a fighter squadron at this point, possibly? That's likely. Okay. For your own diversity. Yeah. and All right. Just keep us flexible, you know. How about you, Wolf? You've been at it, uh, let's see, did I ask you how many years you've been doing this? I'm on uh, 11 years since I graduated in 2008. Yeah. All right. And so what's the plan? You know, I'm getting up on, uh, you have a 10-year pilot training commitment, obviously, when you end. So I'm, I'm at uh, 11 years now. And probably in the next year, I'm getting towards the end of my initial kind of tactical flying that, right. that I'll do. And so kind of the next stepping stone in the Air Force is they'll offer you to go um maybe to a, a staff to go work for a little bit, maybe mm-hmm. at the Pentagon or a, uh, a school. You can apply for like DARPA or go work in DC, go work at the Pentagon. So kind of looking at those options next and uh, I'll find out here in the next month okay. what they offer me and then uh, we'll see from there. But I'm pretty excited to see what happens next. Yeah, well, there's lots of opportunity and it's good that you're still willing to play the game. I know the Air Force is really uh, excited to retain their pilots and their talent, which you uh, are definitely both of those. Well, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Again, I know we could go on and on and barely scratch the surface on this thing. Uh, We always end, as you know, with the show here on Call Signs. Steve, I guess that's not really something you guys do. Uh, Any favorite nicknames uh, with your buddies? Or uh, Certainly, I don't want to ask about any nicknames at home, um, but... (laughs) No, nothing uh, nothing really appropriate. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. All right, well, let's leave it at that. Uh, all right, but uh, Major Nick Anderson, tell me how someone came up with Wolf. Wolf, you know, obviously the share the full story is only over a cold beverage, not That's on right. microphone. <laughs> but uh, what I will share is uh, the Wolf is a play on Wolf of Wall Street. But, you know, Wall Street Uh-oh. is for big shots. And it, I'm more the Wolf of Warrensburg, which is the small town in uh, in Missouri. So. Uh, that's kind of where it came from. I thought you said you were married. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, was... this is a plug for my wife. She looks a lot like Margot Robbie, and ah, she's gorgeous. So excellent. that'll get me some kudos. Well, the, you know, the military pilots, they attract the uh, beautiful wives. But, <laughs> uh, well, you know, kudos to her. We did do an episode on the show about the military spouse, specifically the Navy ones, but they have a difficult job in the military as well. So Senior Master Sergeant Steve Napier, sir, want to thank you for your 18 years of service service to our country and your looks like about uh, one hour and two minutes of time spent with me today. Uh, really appreciate everything you had to say and uh, representing the folks who don't always get the glory, but keep these aircraft flying. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, Major Nick Anderson, Wolf, just thanks again for your time today, your 11 years. Hope you do at least nine more. And uh, it's been really interesting learning all about the B2 spirit. I want to thank you for that. Thanks, Vincent. You're welcome. All right, guys. Unless you got any parting shots, I think we can wrap it up and get out of here. All right, let's do it. See ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. 
Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the host and our guests and do not represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components.